Uh, today's agenda includes, we're going to talk about computer vision. Uh, now, Clarify sort of specializes in computer vision, at least in the sense of that's where we started. Uh, but we do support natural language processing and other kinds of AI, just to sort of mention that. Um, but we're going to be talking about focus today on computer vision, talking about classification, object detection, visual search, facial recognition, and model training. Um, and we're also going to have a demonstration led by Tony and a question and answer session at the end. Um, and again, we encourage you to ask questions in the, in the chat. And uh, just a little bit of background on Clarify before we get started. Uh, Clarify is the leading independent provider of artificial intelligence for unstructured image and video data. We offer an end-to-end -end computer vision and natural language processing platform that covers the entire AI lifecycle. Uh, from data labeling and training all the way through model development and deployment. Uh, Clarify continues to grow uh, with over 90 employees at our headquarters in New York City, our offices in San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and Tallinn, Estonia. And so with that, let's begin today's talk. To begin with, what are we talking about? What is computer vision? Um, so computers work with image files and video files, so visual data. And when we talk about computer vision, we're really talking about a computer's ability to work with and understand visual data. Um, computers can learn the visual features of images and videos, and then use these learnings to identify and classify objects and scenes. To break this down just a little bit, uh, what do we mean by features? Uh, so, computer vision existed before the machine learning revolution, and some of the there are some uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, sorry, computer vision algorithms that have been around for a very long time. And uh, one of the earlier algorithms is demonstrated here, and kind of gives an example of what we mean by a feature. So you can see when you look at the human face in most lighting conditions, um, the nose is going to be more lit up, brighter than the cheeks. And so algorithms were developed, sort of handcrafted uh, by developers to identify when there was a spot that was bright in the middle and dark on both sides. Additionally, eyes tend to cast a shadow and cheeks tend to reflect light. So there was an, another difference found between the darkness of the line of the eyes and the cheeks. Um, and so people were able to, with their imagination and ob through observation, um, find uh, visual features that computers could recognize. So you could feed an image into your system and you could identify these places where there were distinct differences in um, color intensity or in brightness and darkness. Now with machine learning, this ability to identify features has been super powered and taken to, to the next level. Um, and that's the type of computer vision that we're going to be talking about today, where we can identify much finer grained features and we can use our uh, machine learning algorithms to identify these patterns automatically. So we don't have to come up with them in our imaginations. We just feed the system data. So what do we, what do we get out of this? Well, first of all, we can classify objects in our visual data. We can say, what is this thing? Um, computers can be trained to associate real world objects and scenes with concepts. And so by concepts, some people refer to this as metadata, or another way to say it is they're just words, right? So this is a picture of a purse, and then the computer can learn to associate the image of a purse with the word purse or handbag. Um, but how does the computer, an interesting question becomes as, as you start to dig into these things, how does the computer actually decide when something is a handbag or a purse? How does it differentiate between sort of finer point, points of visual observation? Well, this boils down to the predictions that your model is going to be able to make and the thresholds that you will set up on this model. So, now I'm using the word model. So what we are talking about here is this ability for a machine learning algorithm to study a data set and construct a model of that data set 
that is a simplified representation of the uh, the images and the objects in these images. Um, and these models, we will be able to then guess on new data and offer predictions. Uh, predictions are normalized on a scale from zero to one, and a prediction with a high level of confidence would be a one or a 0.99, uh, and low would be zero. And depending on the performance of your model, uh, you're gonna set up thresholds that will decide when or when or when not you are not going to accept an image as actually being a handbag. Object detection takes this process a step further. In the real world, objects, uh, you're usually not just going to see one object at a time, and you'll see several objects on the scene. Uh, object detection helps you find where an object is before um, passing it to your classifier to identify what the object is. And so there are uh, special processes that will locate the objects um, in a scene, and multiple detections are possible in one scene with multiple different kinds of objects. And I would just comment that there is another layer, layer of complexity that we won't really get into today when you start um, identifying objects in video, because what videos really are, are ser a series of still images. And uh, while it's obvious to us when a, a picture of a uh, refrigerator in one, uh, uh, one image is this, the same in the next frame of video, um, but it's not a trivial thing for a computer to identify that. And at any rate, we do offer uh, tracking models as well that can help you track and maintain the identity of an object across frames of video. Okay. Another thing we're going to want to talk about today is visual search. So this ability to identify features ends up being very helpful when we just want to compare the visual similarity of objects. And there's loads of practical applications of visual search, one of which is that you can just insert an image, use an actual image as an input in a search field, as opposed to typing the word blue chair, you can have the actual image. Um, and the actual image of the blue chair that you have in mind has lots more information, lots more descriptive information about what you're after, um, so that you can then search a database for visually similar images and come up with something that's much closer to your original idea than you might ever be able to describe um, with search uh, terms in a search field like a traditional search engine would use. Finally, facial recognition is an important part of um, how these technologies are used. And facial recognition tends to be a combination of the diff different um, techniques that we've already talked about where we're using detection, classification, and visual search, um, plus a little special sauce tends to be used. Um, for facial recognition where we can identify the landmarks in a face um, and um, make algorithms even more efficient, even better at discerning the fine details between people um, so that you can build technologies to, to verify your identity just with, just with an image of your face. Um, additionally, uh, the systems can be trained to recognize people by name. Uh, but you can just search visually, like in this example on the right-hand side, um, and inserted a picture of myself, and you can see that that is matched on the top row a bunch of other pictures of me. And um, uh, but it's also on 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 later rows uh, offered other predictions, other matches that are less likely to be me, but that are still sort of maybe people that look like me. And so thresholding is essential in. Uh, face uh, technologies as well. And for example, you might set a threshold to only accept the top row of, result, of results as a, as a match in, in this sort of a case. Uh, and now with that, I'm excited to turn the floor over to Tony. Um, actually, sorry, I did want to just talk a little bit about uh, model training before I did that, So, which is something that Tony will be showing you. So. We're not in the point in artificial intelligence where we're doing anything like general reasoning, right? So we're only ever able to model a specific data set and make predictions based on uh, a specific model's understanding of the world. So uh, any 
actual practical application of machine learning, you're going to be working with your labeled data in combination with an algorithm, which is there to study your labeled data and find these patterns, find these features, um, and then uh, match that up with the processing power um, that is needed. These are very computationally intensive um, processes. Um, and from that, you're going to be able to generate this model that then can um, you, you'll be able to feed unseen data, feed new data samples to, and can make predictions on these things. Uh, Clarify offers a lot of helpful transfer learning um, uh, models. So this is where you're going to be able to quickly prototype uh, uh, your ideas or quickly build solutions based on model embeddings. And you can think of these model embeddings as uh, really large, well-crafted models built on really well-curated data sets where sort of the top layer has been shaved off. So for example, we might have had a data set that learned everything about handbags and the features of handbags. And we shaved off this particular um, uh, types of handbags that that model was trained on, but we kept the features. And then you can add your own concepts, your own words, and connect those features to the, to the specific concepts and words that you want to learn about. This technique is extremely useful because of how fast it is and how accurate, really, it's astoundingly accurate for, with very little training data. So transfer learning, huge advantages because you're going to be able to use much less labeled data, much less processing power, which means a more responsive uh, prediction and less training time. And with that, I'll hand the floor over to Tony for the demonstration. So today I'm going to take you through a few different steps today. Um, I'm going to focus very highly over, you know, how to get signed up for an account because these are uh, things, these are models that you can start building today. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk through real quick how that works. I'm going to then focus most of my time on how to actually create some models. And so today we're going to walk through basically doing a workshop around how to create some classification models, how to utilize some of our out of the box detection models, and then how to create custom facial recognition. Uh, we'll walk through all of that. And then finally, we'll finish up by being able to look at some code and say, how do we call this via the API? So you can start integrating this into your applications and start to take advantage of the Clarify platform today. So with that in mind, the quick thing that I'd like to show you here is just this uh, nice button that's on our clarify.com site. Uh, this allows you to sign up for your account. Uh, you can sign up for an account at any time and what that's going to then take you to immediately is a page that looks a bit like this. This is the P Clarify portal. This is where we really start to see the rubber meet the road when it comes to creating <coughs> sorry, creating applications that we can go and start utilizing within our, uh, within our companies. So when we start to see this, the first thing that we have to do is uh, we can go through and hit this button to create an application. The first application that we're going to create today is going to be a custom classifier. This classifier is going to allow us to understand or create a model that can understand uh, a, a series of lungs that actually have COVID in. Uh, diagnosed a previous diagnosis of COVID. So this is fairly, you know, something that I don't have any domain knowledge of how, um, how, you know, the lungs work or anything like that. I couldn't tell you uh, by looking at a picture, but the, but machine learning and through, you know, what, what Jeff was talking about, being able to identify those particular uh, features that are characteristic of lungs that have had COVID in the past um, that's there. And so allowing us to take advantage of these, the imagery and the, the labeled imagery in particular, to be able to say, okay, we're going to create a model that can start uh, classifying lungs, uh, pictures of lungs, x-rays of lungs into these two separate categories is very easy to do on Clarify's platform. And we can do that uh, in about five minutes. 
So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I define an app ID. This app ID is going to be my API endpoint that I can call for when I want to go and start utilizing this. Say if I wanted to build an application that I wanted to put on uh, the Google Play Store on the Apple, uh, the Apple Store. So all I have to do is put in my application ID. Okay, I can go and put in a, a easily understood display name. So if I decide to share this with my coworkers and they can start taking advantage of this, um, this is where I can put that display name. I can then select my base workflow. So the base workflows that we have here are going to be uh, all of the things that are available out of the box. So you can see uh, we've got things like travel model, uh, we've got things like the food model, apparel model, moderation. Um, all of these kind of allow us to get a jump start because these are also pre-trained embeddings models that we can take advantage of if we're wanting to uh, train a model for a particular vertical sector that we wanted to focus on. I'm going to go ahead and select create here. Now this is going to uh, this is going to create the little silo here that I've got for my data. Now the next thing that I can do is I select the data mode here. Data mode screen takes me to the ability to you know look at my specific uh, data sets that I have available. And now I've got two separate data sets. One is for the training data for COVID and one is for testing data. And so typically I will have reserved some data for actually going back and testing out my model after I've gone through and trained. So I'm not reusing uh, data that I've trained on for, uh, for testing. So uh, the first step is I'm going to import my data for all of the lungs that have been diagnosed with COVID. Let me go ahead and hit okay here. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and let that data upload in process. And so I've got about 20 pictures. Uh, they've all uploaded to the Clarify portal and they've been processed. Now this is all available via the API as well. So I can create a Python script that can do the same thing through web services as what you're seeing here. But this is just a good way to visualize it so I can share on our webinar here. I'm gonna go ahead and select my data set um, I can go ahead and I'm going to create a concept for these. This is going to be COVID lungs, not lunch. <laughs> Let me go ahead and hit add. All right. I'm going to label the selection as COVID lungs. Go ahead and hit label. Now my data has been labeled. The next step will be to go ahead and create a, uh, I'm going to go ahead and teach the model what healthy lungs look like as well. So I'm, I've got some uh, data that's also, you know, non-COVID lung, lungs that have been uh, uh, labeled as such. Okay, go ahead and hit add there. I'm going to look at my concept here. I can go and drill into this particular class. And what I see here is that I've got my uh, data that I want to go ahead and add because there's no data present for this concept today. I'm going to go ahead and hit add. And now I can browse to my training data for normal lungs. So let me go ahead and select these guys. I'm going to go ahead and hit open. Now I've got all of the data that's coming from that particular folder is being uploaded into, uh, into this particular concept. So I've got 20, uh, 20 positively labeled non-COVID lungs and 20 that are labeled as COVID. So the good thing is that this is really showcasing how little data is really required for being able to create a model. Let me go ahead and hit the create a model button. This takes us to the Clarify gallery of all of our different models that we have available. Um, I'm going to go ahead and this is just going to be a basic classifier model, a custom classifier. I'm going to go ahead and give it a name. I'm going to go and, and give a display name for the model as well. This will be displayed on our Explorer view when we're back looking at our data. I'm going to select the concepts that will be part of this model that I'm going to be training on. And I'm going to go ahead and hit create model. I'm going to hit this button here. This is the last thing that I need to do to be able to have a model that's custom designed around my data and that's being trained to be able to identify those concepts. Now, what we see here is this takes 
literally seconds to go through the training data and start to create that model for us. Let me drop back to my Explorer view. What we see now is that COVID or not COVID is my active model and it's been trained and it's ready to go. So the next step that I need to really be able to take is using that test data to start looking whether or not, you know, how accurate my model is and what the returns, what the results are. So I'm gonna take some COVID data here. I'm gonna go ahead and hit open. So this is gonna add another uh, data point to my Explorer view and I can go and browse into this and I can look at my custom model predictions. And what we wind up seeing is that with a high level of confidence, uh, this test data for COVID lungs has predicted a result that these lungs do indeed have COVID. So 99.99% um, similar to the other lungs and the features that the other lungs have present in them. Okay, so I can't really tell the difference on whether a lung has it or not, but the machine, uh, the machine learning trained model can. And so this is a quick shortcut to being able to identify those kinds of things. So let's go back and let's start taking a look at a detection model. The next step around detection is really going to be deciding what kind of detection we want to take place here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit create application here. I'm going to create a detection model specifically for my clothing company. So if I had a, a specific set of clothing that I wanted to look into and be able to understand, you know, this is a top, this, these are pants, what kinds of pants or shoes are uh, within this, I'm going to start with being able to use my detection model. All right. Um, so this is going to then break out specifically like where in the images each one of those uh, pieces of clothing are. All right, I'm gonna take advantage of just our general detection model. So that's gonna tell me where uh, in, the, in each image it is. And then we're gonna actually take that and, and kind of walk through how to uh, do, how to then apply uh, apparel classification to it as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit create here. So this is my detection model for clothing. I'm gonna go ahead and start doing the same thing where I add data to this particular model go ahead and click my data sets and I'm going to select women's clothing here and select I've got a few a few images that I've curated for our uh, demo here let me go ahead and go to our uh, we can see that they've been uploaded and that they're processing right now <clears throat> and let's bounce over to our Explorer view so we've got our images of, of clothing here. Let's click on one of them and see, see what this looks like. So we start to see that we're uh, being able to detect within the frame specific concepts around like this is a person that's standing within my frame. We then run that through a cropper that's focusing just on that area of the image and we start to classify using the general model uh, precisely what kind of uh, what kind of thing is actually being detected there. So we see denim pants that are casual, right? Um, isolated is the kind of image. And so we start to get this kind of these kind Tony, you muted yourself again. That's fun. Okay. That's the first time that's happened to me. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, we, we now have the ability to see and, and uh, look at, you know, precisely where in the photograph the, the different concepts are being located at. And we get that visibility. Now the next step that we want to do is really take that to uh, being able to uh, run this through an apparel model. So we can actually figure out, you know, are these denim jeans, you know, what do these uh, sandals look like, for example, if we wanted to pull out that kind of level of information. The next step we'll have to take is creating a workflow. Now, the workflow itself is going to be very simple. We're going to have a three-step workflow of using, uh, using the visual detector and then running an image crop over it, and then putting that through our visual classifier specifically for apparel. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit create workflow here. And these are all gonna be out of the box uh, detection workflows and uh, classification workflows that are available from Clarify. Okay, so let me go ahead and select 
our model type ID, the first thing that we're going to want to do is use our visual detector from Clarify. And this is going to take us to our apparel detection. Now, this is a specifically trained detection model that's looking for those different pieces of clothing in our imagery. Now, the next step is, as we were saying, we want to focus on being able to crop down and focus on those particular uh, pieces of apparel. I'm going to go ahead and do a cropper. And then the final step that I want to take is really going to be around that visual classifier. So I'm going to select my visual classifier as the last step. So I've got my apparel visual classifier that's been trained on a large curated set of data once again. And I'm going to go ahead and select the uh, way that I want my workflow to actually let the data flow. So I have my apparel detection where it starts, cropper next, and finally ending off with my apparel classifier. I'm going to go ahead and hit create workflow here. And my apparel workflow has been created. I'm going to go over to my explorer view, and I want to be able to look back at this picture again, where we had our general detection coming through with, you know, high level of confidence that we have denim pants and casual, right? We want to look at this and see, you know, what does this look like when it comes to uh, applying apparel detection? So it takes a minute for it to run through for the first time. And what we see here is that we've got, uh, we're not just identifying uh, the individual person and then looking at what's on the person. We're identifying things like the pants, the top and the shoes. And then we're taking that over to our classifier to be able to say, you know, these are women's sandals. And so this level of classification can then come back and, and let us, you know, if we wanted to even do a custom classifier, like if in your region you had a different name for these, uh, for these individual objects, you could uh, once again use that same idea that I showed you with the COVID lungs classifier to create your own classifier for clothing, as well as, you know, be able to define it for the words that you guys are most comfortable with, okay? So with that in mind, let's start talking about custom facial recognition. Let me go ahead and add in uh, a new application that's going to focus around facial data. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call this custom facial recognition. Lots of letters to type. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and hit face here for my base workflow. Go ahead and hit create. And so what we see here is I got my new custom facial recognition application. The next step that I want to take is once again going to be that first step that we always have to take, which is adding data. I'm going to go ahead and hit uh, my data sets here. I'm going to look for facial recognition data. And so I've got a selection of different facial recognition data that's present here. I'm going to go ahead and hit open, and this is going to add in all of these faces into my application. Now, this could be uh, if you have a uh, list of your the employees of your company, if you wanted to, you know, be able to check in employees at your gate or be able to identify people who should or shouldn't be on premise, for example. Um, all that this takes is, you know, taking the, the shots of everybody. And so these are a bunch of Clarify employees, all of the, the wonderful people who uh, work on our back end. And, you know, we've got Jeff there too. Uh, and I've uploaded all of those images here. And we're going to we're going to take this and be able to use this as the source for um, the source for data. Right. So, you know, this is all of my employee data. I'm going to go ahead and hit. Uh, add for my data mode here. And I'm going to take a particular uh, URL so I can add it, uh, add an image, not simply uh, by finding a file and browsing for a file, but I can also use a URL of a file. So I'm going to go ahead and select that and add that to my data set. And so what we see here is that that beautiful image of myself is up there along with uh, all of our other folks from our employee file. And what I want to be able to do here is be able to do a uh, custom facial recognition search. So this could be submitted once again through API, and I could uh, basically do the return of being able to search against my image here. You go ahead and hit refresh. And we see that my uh, facial recognition profile has come back 
uh, with me being as the most likely candidate to match this photograph of me. So that's uh, always a positive set of results to get. All right. So with that in mind, let's then take this, uh, this same idea and let's um, start to utilize the uh, workflows that we have for demographics. So if we want to you know, take this same imagery and be able to run this through a demographics model where we're focused on uh, being able to find the multicultural appearance, gender appearance, as well as the age appearance of a particular individual, what that allows us to do is create a new application once again. So we once again walked through our uh, handy dandy create an application wizard. I'm going to go ahead and hit demographics from the workflow. So this is going to you know, be the base workflow for demographics. And once again, what we see here is that we've got our demographics workflow uh, created as our base workflow for our demographics application. Now, instead of uh, feeding this data in through our uh, Explorer view, what we actually want to do is be able to take this and utilize this through APIs. And so I've taken a script that's available on our docs.clarify.com page. And I've created a uh, Python script that's going to basically uh, pull in this data for me. So I've got my API key that I'm going to utilize right here. Let me go ahead and hit copy key. I've got my terminal window where I've got my ability to uh, use a Python script. And I'm going to put in the information for my key right here. So just paste in that demographics key. And I'm going to use this as the source image, this uh, URL right here. And I'm going to go ahead and write that out. And I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, run this with Python. And what this does is it's uh, obviously reaching out and, and uh, telling the API at Clarify uh, all of the information that's required to be able to return a particular result. And so this is the JSON response that we would expect to see from that that could be consumed by, say, our mobile application or if we had uh, a particular application that we were using. Um, we, what we see here is that we return back uh, the different concepts around my particular uh, cultural appearance, right? So I appear to be white. Um, from the gender appearance, I appear to be male. And from the, um, I appear to be masculine, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, from the actual uh, classification around my age, uh, it's accurate once again, uh, to say that I'm, I'm somewhere between 30 and 39 years old. It's very flattering. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, we have time for questions now. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen and let's turn it back over to Jeff to go ahead and moderate, Jeff and Tom. Oh, okay, so my microphone's back on and that's key. We've learned that that is always essential. Um, and uh, let me share my screen just to give us something to look at here. There we go. There we go. Okay. Well, thanks for so many great questions that have come through. Um, and actually, maybe before we even get into those questions, uh, I've added this slide just to put it all in context, right? So how, how is all of this currently being used? How are these technologies actually at work um, in, in the world that we're in today? Uh, we've broken it into five uh, industries where we uh, see most of our um, clients working currently. Um, and uh, just wanted to kind of leave this up on the screen uh, to give a little bit of context about the way that these uh, kind of technologies um, are being used right now in the field. Um, and I uh, wanted to get into some of these questions. Now we had a lot of great uh, questions here. Can you feed x-rays that are not normal, but have other diseases into this model? 
Yes. So you can create models that uh, can learn multiple concepts. And in fact, Clarify offers a, a knowledge graph um, where you can create a hierarchy of relationships even between these concepts um, for uh, various use cases. So yeah, you, you could uh, potentially classify a, a wide range of, of uh, issues. Now, this being said, uh, you generally want your model as simple as you can get it for what you need for your use case. So models that continually grow and grow and grow and get uh, uh, have endless um, uh, concepts added to them and, and end, endless dimensions can be um, can suffer because the, the, typically there's there's a uh, reduction in accuracy as you do that. Um, next question up, is this free to use? Yes, it is free to use. Uh, there is a community level. I mean, obviously this is what we uh, do for work. So this is also, um, uh, there are various tiers available to our users, but there is a free tier available uh, where you get a thousand operations a month, thousand inputs a month, uh, which is more than enough to prototype um, uh, lots of different uh, ideas and, um, and definitely to get, to get to know our platform. Uh, another question, uh, what is the wedding model matchmaking? Uh, the wedding model uh, is one of, uh, to give a little context, is one of the many uh, specialized pre-built models. Um, and this was a model that was trained to study wedding photography. Um, and so it specifically, it can identify the features um, that uh, wedding photographers uh, would care about. Um, uh, wedding, wedding photography, incidentally, is 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 a uh, high volume of um, uh, there's a high demand for uh, wedding uh, photography, and, and in terms of visual data, it's one of those fields where there's a lot of interest. Um, Anurag asked, "Are those the right probabilities?" Um, that that is a really great question. I am a little out of context in where that question was asked during the presentation, but in, a, in some sense, the answer is yes. Uh, the probabilities are deterministically presented, right? So th it, those are the probabilities that the given model being used would represent, uh, used to represent that given input um, again and again and again, right? So now, is a given model doing the thing you need to be done? Is it properly modeling the set of data that you want to work with? Uh, maybe so, and maybe not. Um, and there really is a lot to uh, that particular topic. And, um, uh, and that's where model customization would come in. And that's where um, really curating your own da training data set would come in. And I would refer you to uh, resources online and our documentations page uh, for more detailed information about how to really get your solution built. Um, do we accept uh, mp4.mov videos versus pictures? Yes, we have, um, and I can, uh, let me just bring you here to our, uh, so let's just go to our docs page because we do show you all of the, uh, supported file formats. So this, these are the currently supported file formats that you'd be able to work with. All right. And, and the, the docs.clarify.com site is a great place to go for being able to explore the API. We have our different API uh, information available there as well as, you know, data for Postman. Uh, you can easily find uh, API client information here as well. So you can easily take, be able to take advantage of, of that to build your own applications. Yeah, and for a lot of the basic calls, I mean, you can just copy and paste uh, code samples in, in many of the most common languages. Um, exactly. So yeah, uh, definitely a good resource there. Another question, how many pictures are needed to recognize the faces? Um, this is something I, I'd say we're especially proud of is that with Clarify, it's really a lot less than you would need um, otherwise. Uh, we have so many pre-built models that have these sophisticated uh, feature 
sets uh, underlying what they do that you can get a good, accurate understanding of of facial data with really very few inputs. Now, um, in, in your specific use case, there may be something to it that could make it more complex, but really the using these pre-built models and customizing on top of them, using those embedding models and then uh, making your own custom model on top of them is just really, really quick. And, and um, I think it's kind of fun to play with myself. So uh, let's see. All right, um, I'm, uh, let's see the other questions that may be coming in. Tony, do you have additional questions you've seen here? Yeah, there's there's a few. Um, being able to utilize you know 360 degree views of faces, um, if you have that kind of photography uh, available to you, that can be a training source, but you kind of want to be able to keep the training sources consistent with how you're going to be taking an image. So being able to uh, being able to do that is a, a possibility and it's certainly something you can experiment with. Um, as far as being able to uh, do masks, uh, we do have different customers who are uh, taking advantage of our uh, our, our uh, custom facial recognition for people who are also wearing masks. So that that's something that you know we do we do see people uh, utilizing. Obviously, uh, some level of accuracy is is lost when you can't see the entire face or all the facial features. So that's something that can uh, definitely be experimented with as well. Um, facial detection when there's more people, uh, that is something where being able to utilize a workflow is definitely helpful because then you can actually break out each one of the individual people within the scene and put that through uh, either visual similarity search or a, a specific classifier that you could build. Um, all of that is, is also available. Uh, for when training face detection, is it best to feed tightly cropped faces? Um, tightly cropped faces is somewhat helpful, but what we're doing is we're focusing on the landmarks and using landmark detection to drive that. So uh, you may get different results if you feed in uh, too tightly cropped faces uh, versus if you feed in just something that's showing the whole head, the, the whole head and neck. All right. Um, I would just add to that particular point that part of what is happening behind the scenes with detection um, is that there we are setting up a workflow that can that identifies the location of the face in the image and then crops it out for you and and then would send that that region of the image in for classification. So that's all automated. For, yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't you don't need necessarily have to define that. Um, and then when it comes to bounding boxes, we do support bounding boxes. So being able to uh, both label and train using bounding boxes for detection models is available in the platform. Um, can you deploy the model into your infrastructure and run inferences on your servers? Um, that's that's a different uh, type of question. So the, the Clarify platform is available uh, through SaaS and it is uh, something that we do, um, we do work with customers to be able to deploy that on their servers as well. Um, from a physical architecture, we do uh, we can run locally, um, we can run on the edge, we can run in cloud. So all of those are available for customers, and we do help architect solutions that uh, can meet your needs. Um, I think I think we're running very low on time. We're already five minutes over. Um, did you want to cover anything else, Jeff? I think that we had a lot of great questions and I really just wanted to thank everybody for joining us. Um, you, we're gonna be sharing this video uh, for your future reference. And then we've got a bunch of additional resources on YouTube and then again on, on our website. So we just want people to kind of know about that. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining us today. Yeah, and if you guys have any more questions that you'd like to ask, or if you'd like to drop us an email, um, I think uh, I think we can certainly accommodate that through our website. Feel free to contact us and reach out, and we will uh, we can definitely set up uh, a time to talk to you.